First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. Or identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. And automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology. Real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. This is Space Time Series 26, Episode 103, for broadcast on the 28th of August, 2023. Coming up on Space Time... India lands its first mission on the moon, and it's the first to reach the South Pole. Meanwhile, a Russian spacecraft crashes in its attempt to reach the lunar South Pole. And have scientists solved the mystery of Neptune's disappearing clouds? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. India has become only the fourth nation after the Soviet Union, the United States and China to land a spacecraft on the moon and the first to land near the lunar south pole. We are approaching the vertical descent phase two, which will have the lander module hovering at nearly 150 meters above the lunar surface. The sensors that are updating at this point are providing confirmation of the safety of the landing site. As expected, the retargeting is going on and this is a very good signature for the lander. Currently, only two engines are now being fired and uh, we are nearly at zero velocity, vertical and horizontal. We, are, we were hovering and now we are approaching the moon's surface. Ji haan, aap apne screen pe dekh sakte hai ki hum People are applauding. Lander Let us module. all wait to hear from the Secretary Department of Space and Chairman ISRO, Sri S. Somnath. The hard work of the entire ISRO community has come to fruition. Sir, we have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. The tremendous achievement came just days after Russia's competing Lunar 25 spacecraft crashed while attempting its own South Pole lunar landing. Mission managers at ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, cheered wildly and embraced colleagues as the Chandrayaan 3 or Mooncraft 3 in Sanskrit touched down at 6.04 p.m. local Indian time. The Chandrayaan-3 mission has captivated Indian public attention ever since launching nearly six weeks ago. The 3,900-kilogram spacecraft is comprised of three main sections. There's a propulsion module, a lander module, and a little lunar rover. The Vikram, or Vala lander, separated from its propulsion module six days ago in order to begin a slow orbital descent down towards the lunar surface. And unlike the previous Chandrayaan-2 mission, which lost control and crashed during its final landing sequence back in September 2019, this time things went exactly according to plan. Chandrayaan-2's failure was eventually attributed to a software glitch, setting the spacecraft off course at an altitude of around 2.1 kilometers while descending at a breakneck rate of 58 meters per second, much too fast to achieve a soft touchdown. Additional technology aboard the latest Chandrayaan-3 version of the lander allowed for greater attitude control during entry, descent and landing and included a laser Doppler velocimeter which measured attitude in three dimensions. The landing struts were also stronger and there was more instrumentation redundancy making the 1,471 kilogram lander a much tougher all-round vehicle. 
Aboard the lander was the small 26-kilogram six-wheeled Pragayan or Wisdom rover. It descended to the lunar surface less than two days after landing and is now exploring the lunar terrain. It'll spend the next 14 Earth days, that's the equivalent of half a lunar day, studying the local environment. The rover will take multiple measurements to support research into the composition of the lunar surface. It'll search for the presence of water ice in the lunar soil. It'll look at the history of lunar impacts in the area. And it will look at the evolution of the moon's ultra-thin atmosphere or exosphere. Meanwhile, ISRO says the propulsion module itself is still in orbit, and its journey is certainly not over. Over the coming months and years, it'll undertake spectroscopic studies of the Earth's atmosphere and measure variations in light polarization being reflected off the planet's cloud cover. This could provide useful comparison data for future observations of Earth-like exoplanets in order to help determine their habitability. One of the most staggering aspects of the Indian lunar and, well, really Indian space program as a whole is how economically the whole thing is done. The budget for the entire Chandrayaan-3 mission was just $74.6 million. Now, Australia spends more than that each year on recreational sporting facilities. So when the government tells you there's no money for a decent space program, you know they're lying. It all really demonstrates the different priorities and future ambitions of the two nations, India and Australia. In 2014, India became the first Asian nation to put a spacecraft in orbit around Mars, and it's slated to launch its first manned mission into orbit next year. It certainly appears like the Indian giant, now the world's most populous nation, has awakened. This is space time. Still to come, the Russian Luna 25 mission crashes while attempting its own landing at the moon's south pole. And has the mystery of Neptune's disappearing clouds been solved? All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, as India celebrates, Russia remains in mourning following the Luna 25 mission's crash landing while attempting to touch down on the moon's south pole. Mission managers with the Russian Federal Space Agency say the spacecraft suddenly began spinning out of control during pre-landing manoeuvres. In its official statement, Roscosmos says preliminary findings indicate that the Luna 25 lander has ceased to exist following a collision with the moon's surface. The agency says attempts to locate the craft and make contact with it have been unsuccessful. It says a ministerial investigation will now be opened in order to determine the possible causes of the incident. The 800-kilogram Luna 25 probe was launched a week ago aboard a Soyuz 21B rocket from the Ustoshny Cosmodrome in Russia's Far East. The spacecraft had successfully entered a 100-kilometer high lunar orbit four days later and soon began its slow descent towards the lunar south pole. The mission was part of a Moscow dream, trying to relive the glory days of the former Soviet Union's pioneering space program. However, the launch came at a time when the Russian ruble was crashing in the wake of the ongoing Western sanctions brought about by Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Alienated from Western nations by Putin's war, Roscosmos says it wanted to show the world that Russia was still capable of delivering a payload to the moon and ensure the Kremlin's guaranteed access to the lunar surface. Like its Indian counterpart, Luna 25 was initially slated to carry a small lunar rover to take and analyse soil samples and search for signs of water. But that idea had to be abandoned in order to reduce weight as the mission could no longer use the advanced lightweight Western electronics it had been hoping to install and instead had to rely on heavier domestically made components. The European Space Agency was working with Roscosmos not just on the Luna 25 mission, but also on the two subsequent missions, Luna 26 and 27. But it withdrew from all three missions following Moscow's attacks on Ukraine. The last Russian mission to the moon was the Luna 24 back in 1976. That was under the communist dictatorship of the Soviet Union, which collapsed in 1991. 
The Soviet Union last attempted to land on a celestial body in 1989. That was with its Phobos 2 mission, but that mission failed after an onboard computer malfunction. Russian missions to Mars in 1996 and another attempt to reach the moon Phobos in 2011, this time using the Phobos Grunt mission, also failed. Phobos Grunt not even leaving Earth orbit. This is space time. Still to come. Has the mystery of Neptune's disappearing clouds finally been solved? And later in the science report, detection of a new highly mutated version of the SARS-CoV-2 virus which causes COVID-19. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account, where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. For the first time in nearly three decades of observations, clouds usually seen in the Neptunian atmosphere have all but vanished. Images taken between 1994 and 2022 show clouds are nearly all gone, with the only exception being around the Neptunian South Pole. But the observations reported in the journal Icarus have also revealed a never-before-seen connection between Neptune's disappearing clouds and our Sun's 11-year solar cycle. It's a surprising finding, given that Neptune is the furthest major planet from the Sun and therefore receives only one nine-hundredth the sunlight which the Earth gets. A University of California Berkeley-led team of astronomers discovered the abundance of clouds normally seen in the blue planet's mid-latitudes started to fade in 2019. The authors were surprised by how quickly clouds disappeared on Neptune, dropping within just a few months. The study's lead author, Randy Chavez, from Harvard University Center for Astrophysics, says that nearly four years later, the images show that the clouds still haven't returned to their former levels. She admits it's extremely exciting, but also rather unexpected, especially since Neptune's previous period of low cloud activity was not nearly as dramatic or prolonged. To monitor the evolution of Neptune's appearance, Chavez and colleagues analysed images from 1994 to 2022 using the Keck Observatory's second-generation near-infrared camera paired with its adaptive optic system as well as observations from the Lick Observatory and from NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. The data revealed an intriguing pattern between changes in Neptune's cloud cover and the solar cycle, the 11-year period when solar activity increases and then decreases again, climaxing with a flip in the sun's polarity. When the sun emits more intense ultraviolet radiation, specifically the strong hydrogen lime and alpha emissions, more clouds wind up appearing on Neptune about two years later. The authors further noticed a positive correlation between the number of clouds and the ice giant's brightness from the sunlight reflecting off it. The findings support the idea that the sun's ultraviolet rays, when strong enough, may be triggering a photochemical reaction that produces Neptune's clouds. The connection between the solar cycle and Neptune's cloudy weather pattern is derived from two and a half cycles of cloud activity recorded over the 29-year span of Neptunian observations. During this time, the planet's reflectivity increased in 2002 to brightness maxima and then dimmed to brightness minima in 2007, before getting bright again in 2015 and darkening again in 2020 to the lowest point ever observed, which is also when most of the clouds went away. 
changes in Neptune's brightness caused by the Sun appears to go up and down relatively in sync with the coming and going of clouds on the planet. However, more work is necessary in order to properly unpack this correlation given the complexity of other factors. For example, while the increase in ultraviolet sunlight could produce more clouds and haze, it could also darken them, thereby reducing Neptune's overall brightness. Now, Neptune's an ice giant, but it also has a very thick atmosphere, like a mini gas giant. And storms on Neptune rising up from the deep atmosphere affect the overall cloud cover at the top. But they're not related to photochemically produced clouds and hence may complicate correlation studies with the solar cycle. Astronomers think continued observation of Neptune will be needed in order to see how long the current near absence of clouds lasts. It's a discovery which adds more exciting observations to the blue world's widely active and chaotic atmosphere. It's an atmosphere which already features record-breaking methane clouds whipped around the planet at supersonic speeds, the fastest wind speeds recorded anywhere in our solar system. One of the earliest and most striking images of Neptune was captured by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft during its flyby of the Neptunian system in 1989. That revealed a massive storm system known as the Great Dark Spot. Other storms and dark spots have been spotted since, in particular a large equatorial storm in 2017 and a large dark spot in the northern latitudes in 2018. This report from NASA TV. Recent observations from the Hubble Space Telescope show that Neptune's clouds are almost completely disappearing. Astronomers report that their continual monitoring of Neptune's weather uncovered a link between its shifting cloud abundance and the 11-year solar cycle in which the Sun's entangled magnetic fields drive solar activity. When activity on the Sun increases, more intense ultraviolet radiation floods the solar system. Astronomers found that two years after the solar cycle's peak, the number of clouds on Neptune increases. The link between Neptune and the Sun's activity is surprising to planetary astronomers because Neptune is the outermost major planet where sunlight is 1 900th the intensity Earth receives. To monitor the evolution of Neptune's appearance, astronomers analyzed Hubble Space Telescope archival observations beginning in 1994, Keck Observatory images taken from 1994 to 2022, and Lick Observatory data from 2018 to 2019. The combined data will enable further investigations into the physics and chemistry that lead to Neptune's dynamic appearance, which in turn may help deepen astronomers' understanding not only of Neptune, but also of planets beyond our solar system. This is Space Time. Time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new highly mutated variant of the SARS-CoV-2 virus which causes COVID-19 has now been detected in Europe and North America. Scientists are on alert and scrambling to understand the new BA 2.86 strain which has been named Pirola. They're trying to determine how far it's already spread and how well human immunity will defend against it. What is known so far is that it has more than 30 amino acid changes to its spike protein compared to the next closest BA2 subvariant of Omicron. The World Health Organization has now designated BA2.86 as a variant under monitoring, a designation that encourages countries to track and report the sequences they find. A variant under monitoring which causes more severe disease or one which evades existing vaccines and treatments is then upgraded to a list of variants of interest or variants of concern. These include XBB 1.5, XBB 1.16 and EG5, the Aries variant which is now the dominant strain in the United States. Some 7 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it was first detected near China's Wuhan Institute of Virology around September 2019. The World Health Organization estimates the true death toll is likely to be around 18 million, with some 770 million 
confirmed cases globally. There are fresh warnings today that the forecast drier than usual Australian spring, combined with wetter growing conditions in recent past years, have all helped set the stage for what could be a major bushfire season. The Bureau of Meteorology, Australia's Weather Bureau, is predicting the drier spring to come. This combined with past wetter conditions which promoted lots of growth means large areas of Australia are set to see higher bushfire risk in coming months, according to the National Council for Fire and Emergency Services. The warnings which are contained in the latest seasonal bushfire outlook report identifies large areas across the Northern Territory, Queensland and New South Wales which are at much higher risk of bushfire this season, along with patches of Victoria and South Australia. Archaeologists are getting a better idea of what Bronze Age diets might have been like thanks to a new analysis of proteins found on ancient teeth and cauldrons dating back over 4,000 years. A report in the journal iScience says researchers combined analyses from the oldest pots ever found in order to explore the kinds of meals people were eating during the Mycop period some 2700 to 2900 BCE that covered an area spanning from modern-day southwestern Russia through to Turkey, including the Caucasus, Georgia, Azerbaijan and even Armenia. Scientists successfully retrieved proteins, including heat shock proteins, from blood, muscle tissue and milk, indicating people were cooking deer, cows, yaks and water buffalo. Milk proteins from either sheep or goats were also recovered, indicating that the cauldrons were used to prepare dairy as well. The usually highly respected scientific journal Nature has been placed under the spotlight for publishing a study which includes data obtained through a controversial method known as facilitated communication. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics has the details. The story is, is a bit of a sad one, actually. Nature, you have to, probably have to start with Nature. It's the Nature article which sort of spawned all this. Uh, Nature is a prestigious learned journal that published a lot of sort of cutting-edge results of research, etc. So it is highly regarded generally, but it can put its foot in its mouth occasionally. Every so often. You mean like the Lancet? Uh, yeah, like the Lancet, like a lot of things. They sort of, yeah, the Lancet and the triple vaccine thing when it's leading to autism, etc. So, yeah, it happens. Now, what particularly happened here was that Nature was publishing quite justified articles that if you're going to do research on people with serious autism, so low functioning autism, etc., maybe you should get some people who are low functioning to actually give input rather than have high functioning people who are not so badly affected or even people who don't have autism at all, assuming there are such people. And that this seems like a good idea. Fair enough. You get people involved who are actually the ones who need the treatments or need the research. The trouble is with this, with autism, people who are very non-speaking, non-oral, and who are maybe physically disabled as well, trying to get them input is difficult, obviously, for obvious reasons. And so there's been this technique that's been around 30, 40 years called facilitated communication. And facilitated communication is when you have a severely autistic person, or it could be dementia or cerebral palsy or various things like that, but someone who can't really speak clearly at all, if not at all, and can't control their movements, you get a facilitator or a helper to help almost in a way interpret what they're trying to do and this often comes down to a case of you might have a little typewriter or a a set of letters that sort of spelt out on a board or something like that and with the help of the facilitator the person who's severely handicapped might be touching different letters and spelling things out. The question is here that and it's pretty obvious at times that it's the facilitator doing the spelling not the patient not the person who's autistic doing it and it is facilitated and it's actually more directed and people who follow this technique are very strongly believing in it they're probably very sincere but when you do tests on it it shows pretty clearly that it's the facilitator who is spelling out these messages and not the person suffering themselves the person is spelling out a message and sometimes these messages are very sophisticated the theory is that deep within someone who's severely disabled etc is a brain waiting to get out and that's very comforting to families and and parents especially but the, the question is that whether this stuff is genuine and there's very questionable that suddenly people are giving speeches and things which are spelt out not spoken obviously poetry going through higher education with the help of their facilitators and it's very sad this situation that is facilitated communication has been really debunked as a very sad hope giver to people which is totally unwarranted I mean if you look at films of people who are severely disabled in this way supposedly spelling out their messages they're often not even looking at the um, at the board they're not interested that they can or can't even look at it or they're just looking off in different directions or doing something else and yet they're still supposedly spelling out a message on a keyboard 
keyboard, which requires some sort of control to look at where the actual letters are. And you look at this and say, that's obvious. It's not them spelling it, but the facilitators insist that that's what's happening. So come down the Nature article, quoting people who are severely disabled, non-oral, non-speaking, who are then giving advice on this research project. And the implication is that they are using facilitated communicators to put their message across. And there was actually one photo in the Nature article of one of these people who is a high-profile person giving this information, touching letters supposedly on a handheld board. Handheld boards are a problem. Obviously, the person holding it can move it around and you can almost sort of get the person to, to press the key you want, depending on how much movement you want. So Stuart Weiss, who is a psychologist and writes regularly for the Skeptical Inquirer, which is the major US skeptical publication, wrote an article about this saying nature has dropped the ball on this and is in fact actually giving people the wrong impression. The message of the article is fine. People should be involved in research projects and setting policy and things. But the message here is that for these people giving their advice or giving their input is false and that it's hidden away, even though the Nature article doesn't mention facilitated communication. The only way these people could be doing it, by and large, is by this technique, which is a debunked technique and is false and gives false hope. And that should be included in the methods in any Nature article. That's right. But this is more an opinion piece. Yes, absolutely. And facilitated communication really don't have a very good explanation for how it's working, right? Apart from the fact oh, the person just has trouble pressing the keys and we're helping. No, you're directing. And every time they are tested, it disproves what they're claiming that is happening. So that's this Nature article is giving credence subtly Right, without mentioning facilitated communication, but a suggestion that this person can give input is false and is an abuse of that person by suggesting that they're doing this when they're not. That's a sad one. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 